All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we have uh, Herb Magletter speaking to us uh, about uh, the role that uh, phytohormones play in orchard care. Herb is an emeritus professor in the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. In 2006, he became a master gardener with LA County and directs the uh, master gardener orchard team. Uh, he's completed a 200 hour certificate program in ecological horticulture at the University of Santa California, Santa Cruz, and then went on to, in 2007 to become a resident farm apprentice at the Center for Agroecology and S Sustainable Food Systems, it's, which is a 25 acre certified organic farm also at UC Santa Cruz. And in 2013, he got certified in the principles of fruit and nut tree growth, cropping and management at UC Davis Fruit and Nut Research and Information Center. Uh, the Orchard team has completed more than 1,500 hours of volunteer teaching and workshop activity in school and community-based uh, orchards and horticultural institutions under Herb's uh, guidance. So Herb, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I was down in the orchard earlier this morning and I uh, recorded a, a brief uh, video introduction. And so uh, I'll like to play that. I'll kind of introduce this subject um, because it's, it's a rather a new subject for us. Uh, I'm going to hide the floating meeting controls here and uh, I'll start. This, is, this will just take four minutes, but I think it'll give you an idea of what what this uh, subject is all about. Good morning, I'm Herb Mackletter, an instructor with the University of California, Los Angeles County Master Gardener Orchard Team. And the subject we've picked for this morning's meeting is how a greater appreciation for the actions of the plant hormones can dramatically improve the management of our urban and backyard or home orchards. We're at the monthly meeting of the of the South Bay chapter of the California Rare Fruit Growers in the waning months of the year of the COVID virus. If any of you have had the opportunity to visit a high density modern orchard and a contemporary packing facility in the Central Valley, you, you certainly would appreciate the advance of precision orchard management. In a high density apple orchard, the feathered trees with many fruiting spurs are prepared in the nursery by inhibiting the hormone auxin using a cytochrome. All the trees in a block uniformly come out of dormancy by reversing the hormone abscissin. Blossoms and fruit load are controlled by precise hormonal thinning. Fruit is kept from dropping prematurely by blocking ethylene using, using retain and uniformly released for harvest. They're then optimally ripened with full color by applying the hormone ethylene. Avocado orchards in Santa Barbara, Ventura, Riverside County are helicopter sprayed with the naturally produced hormone gibberellin, which increases the yield of market sized fruit 40, 48, and 60 by more than 50%. Crop of 40,000 pounds per acre, that's 110 trees, can be inspected after this application of gibberellin. And this is approved and registered for certified organic production. What is the driver of this uh, need for precision? Well, Washington has 175,000 acres of apples, producing 2.3 million tons of apples per season. California has 1,530,000 acres of almonds, more than 400,000 acres of walnuts, and even more than 25,000 acres of apples. Management of the plant hormones and the PGRs is fundamental to success in growing, harvesting, and marketing tree fruit. Harvesting labor and equipment, trucks, and a slot at the packing house all have to be prepared in advance. If the average uh, high density apple orchard produces, depending on the variety, between 30 and 50 tons of apples per acre. So even a small farmer with 10 acres of apples can't bring uh, 500 tons of apples to market without a precise management and pre-planning. Well, this type of commercial management is not what we're interested in. It's not why we have our home orchards 
and we don't teach this in the Master Gardener program. But the goal and the purpose of the Master Gardener programs supported by the agricultural colleges and universities is that we bring all of this horticultural research to the urban grower so that they too can benefit. After all, it's the urban growers who are supporting all this research in the agricultural colleges. I think you'll be impressed with what you learned this morning and what you can do with this information. And there won't be a cent spent for chemicals. And if you want to purchase a tool, it'll cost no more than a coated cardboard cup of macchiato grande, whatever that is. This is not going to be a chemistry lecture. The discussion is going to be down to earth and all the examples we use will be those that come from small urban orchards just like yours. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this is the, um, I'm going to get rid of that uh, bar at the top again. Apparently it comes on whenever you admit somebody to the, <laughs> to the meeting. So I'm going to have to just hide that. Uh, if you'll let me. Right. These are the main uh, orchard and uh, plant hormones, auxin, cytokine, gibberellins, abscisic acid, and ethylene. So the names may be foreign to you, but most of you know about hormones. You particularly are, are aware of hormones that, uh, that animals and humans have, uh, things like um, thyroid hormone and, and uh, testosterone and, and adrenaline and estrogen. And you know that there are various changes that occur with a paucity of the hormone or excessive hormone. And there's even a hormone uh, in, the, um, in the plant world that's comparable to melatonin. So the plants also and the trees also have a hormone that helps them distinguish between daylight and nighttime and helps them keep track of the seasons. So this will not be quite as foreign, even though the names seem a little unusual. Now we're gonna start with abscisic acid, since that's the dormant, dominant hormone of this season, and it, it has a lot to do with dormancy. So what stimulates this hormone abscissin and sets it in motion? Well, it's the photoperiod. The abscissin keeps track of daylight and nighttime, and when we get to the autumnal equinox, the abscissin begins to form in the trees because the tree, through its genetics, knows that it's the coming of autumn and then winter. And these, this is very specific to the, uh, the deciduous trees and the trees that grow in the north, uh, the, uh, the palm trees and the, uh, and the uh, members of the prunus family, uh, which have to go dormant. Abscissin is stimulated by the autumnal equinox and the beginning of autumn. So that all the trees in the Northern hemispheres, all things like apples, pears, peaches, plums, know when winter is coming and begin forming abscissin. What does it do? Well, it initiates the onset of dormancy, which is demonstrable by the setting of a terminal bud. That's the bud at the very end of each, uh, each shoot. And when that terminal bud is set and leaves fall off at that area, you know the dormancy is beginning. It also sets in motion the translocation of metabolites. So things like chlorophyll, uh, anthocyanin, the, the yellow pigments, xanth xanthochromes, they're all translocated into the trunk and roots, along with all of the carbohydrates and water. It also then closes off the stoma, that are on the undersurface of the leaf. So the leaf can no longer take in atmospheric air and carbon dioxide. So its metabolism stops. It can no longer, it can no longer produce carbohydrate because its source of carbon dioxide has been cut off. Oxen also, uh, abscissin also causes a proliferation of cells in the abscission zones where the petiole enters the leaf. And as these cells proliferate, it closes off first the uh, xylem and then the phloem, and then the leaves fall off. And of course, abscission comes from the same root as scissors. It was believed that the leaves are cut off, but actually it's a very active process. And the abscission then maintains dormancy until the onset of spring. Uh, 
So people say, well, leaves stay on the tree. Sometimes my apples never seem to go dormant. So we have to know how we can manipulate abscissin to which, especially here in Southern California, to assist our trees in achieving dormancy. Because when they don't, all kinds of strange things happen. And there's lots of questions. Why do some trees leaf out in winter? Then the blossoms die. And of course, once the blossoms die, because there's no uh, pollination and uh, the, the cold weather then returns, and those blossoms will never return. And of course, you're losing fruit, and the tree may not produce any fruit at all. And why do some trees set blossoms in the late summer and the fruit never ripens? These are all related to the degradation of the hormone absin, which is maintaining dormancy if you have the right number of chill hours. So what are chill hours? And how do they affect our orchards? And we're going to go into this in some detail because in my decade of, of traveling around the county as a as a consultant for the Master Gardeners, healthy, beautiful trees that people have spent a lot of work keeping them disease-free, fertilizing them, watering them. And they look like beautiful landscape trees, but they produce very little fruit. Sometimes the labels are gone, but when I can identify, identify it as a certain cultivar and we check the chill hours, that's something we cannot correct. Once the tree has been planted and is growing, if the chill hours don't match your area, the fruit bearing will be negligible or nil. And all other things we can correct, uh, correct uh, we can correct fertilizing problems, um, a mineral problem, nutrient problems, water problems, disease problems. But if the chill hours are wrong, that's it. So crop information is downloaded daily from 140 active automated CIMIS, that's California Irrigation Management Information Systems weather stations located throughout California. The cumulative chill hours are entered on the web daily between November 1st and February 29th. So we all have access to this information. 80 of the CIMIS stations have historic number of chill hours, so you can check the chill hours in your area over decades of time. And that's the website. It's at UC Davis Fruit and Nuts. Here's a typical page. Uh, it, it has all kinds of weather-related models, chilling accumulation, pruning chilling predictions, nitrogen predictions. But we're going to go over here. And what's happening here? Chill units. They're the hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit in some areas, but in our area in Southern California, the chill hours are calculated as the number of hours that a tree accrues between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. When the weather is higher, the temperature is higher than that, the tree does not acquire any chill hours, in fact, may lose some. If the temperature is colder than 32 degrees, Again, it doesn't acquire any chill hours, which is fascinating because some of the apples that are grown in the very northern climates are actually low chill because between in the whole month of February, the temperature may not even rise to 32 degrees and may even be below zero for much of that month. So they're not acquiring chill hours, and we'll discuss why that is. And September 1st through August, August the 31st are the important dates. Here are the uh, CIMIS stations, irrigation management stations located around our county. And what you do is you pick one that's closest to your orchard. And, and why that's important will be obvious in the next couple of slides. This is a typical page where you enter your county and you can get all sorts of information about cropping dates and uh, accumulation of chill hours. Here's a page that includes Los Angeles County. So you can see these are all the stations in our county. And here's Long Beach, where most of you live. And you can see in this year, it's accumulating, this was last year, 418 chill hours. But the critical thing is to look at these numbers. Santa Monica averages 24 chill hours a year. Palmdale, 1,357 chill hours. So you can see in Los Angeles County alone, we have every chill hour profile in the US. That's why when you get together with a group, we're other parts of the county, other cities, some people who live in Santa Clara, uh, Santa Clarita, and some in Santa Monica, they have an entirely different experience with their deciduous trees, whether they be plums, nectarines, uh, or uh, any apple variety or any pear variety. 
So there's, a, there's this tremendous variation, and you need to know what the chill hours are in your area. And you need to be careful when you're purchasing trees in the nursery, particularly things called taste test winner. Here's cumulative chill hours for station 174. That's your station. And you can see it over the different years from 2014 to 2019. These are the chill hours accrued from November 1st to late February. And it shows you the range. So that in any particular year, you can have 150 to maybe over 400 chill hours. And that accounts for the majority of crop variation that you see in your trees. There are not other things, but the, the change in the chill hours accrued are going to very definitely affect the cropping and the flower and fruit production in your trees. Okay, what can I expect if I get the chill hours correct? Once chill hours are met, blossoms begin to open, and there you have it. And that, that black bar will disappear in a minute. I had to close off the... What if I get the chill hours wrong? Well, the chances are you're gonna have a lovely landscape tree, although some trees may still produce fruit, but not a bounty. This is what you're gonna expect if your chill hours are matched. If you take the orchard, the uh, what's called the blossom tour, that's published each year by Fresno, you can drive through up along I-5 and all the different roads and see all the orchards, pistachio, plum, apricot, those, Orchards. This was this is a 10,000 acre orchard. All the trees bloom within a few hours of each other, so that harvest can be pre precise and maturation can be precise. These trees, of course, are all clones, and the the climate is pretty uniform in these areas in the Central Valley. But nonetheless, this is what happens when the chill hours of your tree match the chill hours of your site within a reasonable approximation. I photographed this in my orchard last month. So what happens if an orchard requires, acquires more chill hours than is needed by the fruit variety? Well, the tree, the tree blooms. Uh, Jeff, that's, that's, a, that's happening whenever he, ever, ever anybody uh, comes into the, uh, is admitted. I don't know how, to, how you can change that, but that's what, it, it lets me know that somebody's coming in, which I don't need to know. Uh, so I've got, here, I've got it turned off on my end, Herb. It may be okay. Under... All right. Well, I can I, I can manage it, but that's what occurs. Uh, so it may interrupt us a little bit. Uh, a pear tree, an apple tree. This shouldn't be happening. Uh, blooming now with fruit that's never going to ripen. Uh, so that if there's not enough abscisic acid remaining, if the the tree hasn't acquired enough chill hours, then the abscisic acid remains through the spring and it keeps the tree dormant until it acquires enough heat units to finally blossom out. But then if it blossoms out and forms fruit in, in late spring or early summer, the chances are it's not going to uh, mature and they won't be ripe on the tree before the tree goes dormant again. If there's inadequate chill hours for that needed by the fruit variety, the tree blooms late in summer stimulated by heat units and there's not enough time to ripen fruit. And also what's critical in the urban, for the urban grower is this is growing in a backyard orchard. There are trees on one side, there are houses on the other. Some branches are shaded, some get direct sunlight the whole day. So that the trees will not have a uniform blossoming and uh, sprouting because different branches will acquire different numbers of chill hours, which isn't characteristic of a farming area, but is pretty typical of our urban orchards. I was asked to give a, a talk at Santa Monica City College for Earth Day. I went by a very popular uh, chain orchard in Santa Monica to pick up a little tree. I thought it would be nice to have a prop. And I found one that hadn't been sold. It was already potted up. And I took it to the desk to see if I can get a little discount on it. Flavor of Supreme Pluot, and I explained to the manager, nobody in Santa Monica is going to buy this tree, but nobody reads the labels. Uh, they just read that this is, they read that this is a taste test winner. This is a Flavor of Supreme Pluot. But if you, if you look down and read it, you find out it requires 700 to 800 chill hours in an area that gets 24 chill hours. So this will likely blossom out sometime in the next ice age. It's also 
pollen, it's, it's also sterile. It requires another tree to pollinate it. So even though it did uh, blossom out, unless it's a virgin birth, uh, you're still not going to get much in the way of fruit. It's just to be cautious and understand why the chill hours are important. This is sold in Los Angeles County because there are areas that get 800, 900, 1,000, 1,500 chill hours, but not Santa Monica. So the ANR, Agricultural Natural Resources, produces seasonal guidelines for watering fruit trees. And this is the answer to the question, how can we manipulate abscissin to get our trees dormant, even though it's a very warm and bright fall. Well, we withhold water because abscissin is a stress hormone, and you need to stress the trees to get this hormone to develop. So if you'll notice, the ANR recommendation is no additional water for six months during the year. There's nothing in October and April. And in the Central Valley, basically, in October, you turn off the water. Most or to just turn off the water after cropping. They just keep the ground somewhat moist. Remember, when the tree goes dormant, the stomata and the undersurface of the leaf are closed. So there's no more synthesis of, of uh, no more synthesis of carbohydrate at all. The tree cannot undergo photosynthesis. Also, it's not losing any water. The only water it needs is to keep the roots moist or somewhat moist. The rest of the tree requires none, it's all stored. Many of the farm advisors begin advising their orchardists to begin watering in February. And as uh, Dr. DeYoung says, who's chief of palmology at UC Davis, you don't want your trees to wake up dry. Now this is not true for a lot of the trees that you grow, which are subtropical and tropical trees that are cropping in the, in the in our winter season and do require water, but they too go dormant and they too lose their leaves. And if you can adjust your watering, you can help them go dormant and they'll thereby improve your crops. What, what do farmers do? Well, trees are delayed in setting blossoms. Contracts have been let for labor, packing house, supermarket. What does a commercial orchard do to get things going? That is reversing the abscissin. And they use something called Dormex, which can, uh, can metabolize or or reduce the uh, the amount of abscissin in the tree and allow the tree to go dormant. Hydrogen cyanamide blocks the effects of abscissin and its analogs, and it can provide for earlier bud break and a more consistent harvest. In some crops, it can make up for seeing within chill hours and stimulate earlier bud break. So this is done routinely in uh, cherry orchards that are grown in the southern part of, of uh, the Central Valley in California, San Bernardino, et cetera. They eliminate the abscissin chemically so the trees blossom out at the same time. So there is an enzyme which is degrading abscissin, and it only works between the temperature of 32 and 45 degrees. And that's why that's the critical temperature for accruing chill hours that are going to get rid of the abscissin. All enzymes are temperature dependent. They only work in a narrow temperature range. And that's the range of the hormone uh, enzyme that degrades abscissin. And that's why these hours are critical for the accruing of uh, chill hours, no matter how hold, cold it gets. So when all the abscissin is gone, the buds begin to open. And that's the story. Now let's turn to auxin. Uh, I think we've covered abscissin well enough. You, I think you understand what it does and, and why it's important. This is the queen of the plant hormones and is of critical importance to the small orchard farmer, whether it be uh, deciduous trees or subtropical trees. Auxin promotes and maintains apical dominance. And that is the fact that young trees need to establish their place in the orchard by growing rapidly upward into the sunlight because they're surrounded by like trees which are shading everything and they will not survive unless they get their central leader up into the sun. So it oxen maintains paradormancy in the axillary and axial bars. That means that it suppresses any side branches for as long as it can to get only the tip bud to grow where the auxin is, auxin is produced. So it suppresses lateral branch induction, which is critical for understanding how we should be pruning our trees. 
It directs vegetative shoot growth towards the sunlight. It also turns the leaves and flowers and shoots towards the source of light because auxin is very uh, it, much influenced by gravity and by pressure and by light. So if, a, if there is light on one side of a shoot, but not on the other, the other's in shade, the shady side grows more than the light side and the twig begins to bend towards the light. And a variation of the same mechanism turns leaves and flowers daily towards the source of light. Once when I was uh, in Turkey driving north, I, I passed many, many um, acres of sunflowers. And in the morning, they, all the flowers in the whole orchard were turned towards the east. But when I returned from Ephesus in the evening, or the, the uh, late afternoon, the blossoms were turned towards the other side. They, were, they had turned towards the setting sun, and then the next day they'll return. And that's because auxin can cause swelling of the cells on the shady side, which also tends to turn the leaves and flowers. So it's a very, very active hormone, very, very important hormone. How does it affect pruning cuts? We'll look at that in a little more detail. And it impacts summer and winter pruning. Basically, if you begin cutting, uh, doing heading cuts, that is cutting a, a branch down a bit in the mid portion or cutting off the tip in the late summer, it's going to begin to, to leaf out because you've removed the source of the auxin, which is in, in the tip bud. And so you've, you've uh, removed the suppressor of the buds in the axial area of the, uh, of the shoot and branch, and that's what's keeping them dormant. They're in paradormancy. They're not dormant because of the season. I'm gonna show you how auxin affects bud grafting, which is critical because we do a lot of grafting and I know all of you are interested in that. So the question is how can we control the auxin organically and make it work for us? And can our biological manipulation of auxin affect our orchard management? Well, the first thing is in planting. We're taught to plant with the graft above the ground then prune to a knee high whip. Well, many people don't do that. Uh, you know, they bought a whole big tree in the, uh, in the nursery and they paid a lot of money for it. They're not gonna cut it down to a size of a pencil. The critical thing is to know your buds. The bud at the very tip of each branch, each shoot is a proleptic bud. That means it's formed in the previous late summer and autumn. And it has all the internodes already pre-programmed. That bud will grow to a certain number of internodes, 10, 12, during the season. And whether it's late June, early July, once it reaches that, it stops, even though you have all of July and August and September left to grow. So that's very critical. The sileptic buds are buds that are in the uh, axillary area of the petiole. And those are the little buds that can bud out, but they're the ones that are kept in paradormancy. They're only good for one season. Very, very important to know that when you're pruning. The epicormic buds are the ones that are critical at this stage of the growth of your tree because the epicormic buds are underneath the cambium. They're what the tree uses in case of some catastrophe, a branch breaks or the tree is uh, cut. When uh, pruning, Inexperienced pruning teams go through a neighborhood and they hat rack the trees. If you watch, a couple of weeks later, you'll have this shower of shoots that are coming out of the ends of these cut branches. Those are the epicormic buds salvaging the trees. So the trees back up supply in case of a catastrophe, particularly in the northern climates where a branch may break under the pressure of an ice storm or snowstorm. Epicormic buds are also the buds that form the uh, water sprouts that grow straight up in a tree, bear very little fruit or no fruit, and tend to shade out the fruiting branches. The epicormic buds form when a branch is in the shade too much or a shoot is in the shade too much, and the tree stimulates that bud so that it can get something out into the sunlight. So when you cut the tree down, you begin to you stimulate all the epicormic buds and they begin to bud out. And then you choose the ones you want for your scaffold limbs. They'll continue to grow throughout the season 
to 30, 40 internodes, and you can continually prune them to get all of your side branches and the fruiting spurs. And that's how in most commercial orchards, they get the tree to the right height in one season. And there's no question that we can do the same thing if we stimulate the proper buds that give us a whole growing season to form our trees uh, scaffold branches. The heading cut stimulates branching. Well, you know why now, because you're cutting away the bud that's producing the auxin that's keeping all of our other important buds in para dormancy. And they'll keep growing as long as the season has some sunlight and warmth in our area through the end of September. Bare root trees arrive in January and February. They need to be pruned properly. This is, this is an orchard we set up uh, with trees donated by Dave Wilson in, in Valley Glen. The trees are sold like this because they grow in li their liners. They're grown one foot apart in a long row. They're harvested by a, a tractor with huge wheels that sits about four feet off the ground with a big U-shaped blade behind it. It runs down the whole row, cuts all the roots off at the side and bottom. They're then toppled over, the roots are washed, and they're bunched up and taken to nurseries. They know they're not going to, they're not supposed to grow that way, but you can't cut the tree down to a uh, knee, knee height and expect to sell it. So it's partly a marketing tool that they're sold that way. And also it allows you, if you want to start forming your tree and you know you want a vertical Y shaped or a horizontal Y, or you want it in a quad, you have a, a choice of branches. So they give you that opportunity, but for most of us, it needs to be pruned down. If it's not, if it's planted like that, this is what grows. It'll produce some fruit where some fruiting spurs get sunlight, but this is not a fruit tree anymore. If it's cut down, you get the epicormic buds, you can form, form your quadrilateral uh, scaffold limbs, begin to get, get your laterals and your fruiting spurs. You don't want this where the fruit begins, where, barely where you can reach it. This was a tree that was uh, was retrospectively pruned, remedially pruned, and now it's going to bear fruit. This this won't bear much of anything at all, but it's a lovely tree. This is a, a wonderful community orchard out in Pacoima. Uh, uh, excellent group of farmers from Zacatecas, Mexico. Beautiful vegetable beds, and they planted fruit trees, but they get no fruit. They have broken branches, declining production, small damaged fruit, a lot of disease. Here's what the trees look like. They just had no experience with fruit trees. So actually, uh, Steve Huffendahl, who's from the uh, the uh, Foothill branch of the Rare Fruit Growers, and I went there as consultants, and we began to prune their trees. And now they're going to get fruit production because laterals are forming, fruit buds are forming on the laterals, and they get plenty of sunlight. So it's critical to control oxen and to re recognize how it can help you in pruning your trees. Most of the trees, all of the palm trees, pears, apples, every variety, they have very strong apical dominance because they grow forests in, in northern China and southern Russia where there are cold winters, it's very shady. They need to get their branches up into the sunlight. So every one of these trees needs to be trained. It needs The branches need to be spread between 45 and 60 degrees, either with spreaders or by tying them down. The apically dominant trees grow this way normally because they're they're used to a very different climate. They're, they're used to losing a lot of branches in winter from ice and snow. Uh, a lot of the shoots are consumed in the spring by browsing animals, deer, elk. And so the tree that survives produces abundant branches which are not necessary and actually are detrimental in a Southern California orchard. So the right side of this slide is what you need to be aiming at. All of the trees start off growing like that and they need to be spread because oxen is very sensitive to gravity and it will layer out along the underside of the branches. So you're doing almost what you would do without cutting away the apical bud, by spreading it down here, the auxin continues to be formed, but it layers out on the undersurface of these branches to get down to the roots, and it leaves the upper surface of the branches bare of auxin, and they, they blossom out because the blooms and the buds have been freed from the auxin suppression. So as I say here, the underside of the branches are continually suppressed, but the upper side buds are freed from auxin suppression 
which allows flower and leaf buds to break. The other thing that auxin and, and budding hormones stimulate is when sunlight hits the upper side of the branches, the flower buds are favored. If it's shady, the tree's hormones know to produce shoot buds, vegetative buds. When sunlight hits it, the tree knows from its genetics and its hormonal balance that this is the time to set blossoms and fruit. And that's why that's so critical. And, and it's so infrequently done in our home orchards. This is a 500-acre apple orchard. Every single tree is spread. There's a lot of labor, but these these branches that come out now are ready for blossoms rather than a tangle of shoots. This is a high density orchard. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna shut off this floating uh, meeting control again so you can see the top of the slides. Uh, you'll see the bar that, that'll disappear. So this is a high density orchard. All the trees are contract grown and they're treated with something called Maxell, which suppresses auxin and uh, eliminates auxin. So these trees begin branching out even in the nursery immediately. How can we do this organically if we want to grow a compact orchard? Here is a, a tree that uh, a, a young tree that hasn't been treated with Maxell. When it's treated, you can see it becomes a feathered grafted sapling. This is what most high-density orchards want. They want multiple branches growing laterally to get them into maximum sunlight. They don't want scaffold branches coming out here with branches that you can't reach in the sunlight because then you can't harvest them properly. So this is what happens when you treat them chemically. But I'm going to show you how you can do that. And uh, let me turn off the controls again. So this is called notching or forcing a bud. And basically, a tree should fill its allotted space. It's a major objective of orchard management and tree training. And you can use a very simple tool called a girdling knife. This is the method we use to create feathered trees in organic management. It's labor intensive, but that's organic. And I'll show you an entire small orchard done with a one quarter inch rat tailed file creating feathered branches. So this is a little tree growing in a in a school orchard, very nice school orchard in Venice, California. It's 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 a it's a half a year now, uh, midsummer, and it's being trained beautifully. The branches are grown and they're being pulled down, and they're four, one in each quadrant, north, south, east, west, and the second whorl is north, south, east, west, but up so that it doesn't shade the lower branches. This is going to be a beautiful producer, but it's missing the branches on this side. And I, I don't know what happened. Maybe a, a kid ran through and broke them off early on when it was just a little sapling. So what we do is we notch it. So this is this is the notch cut with a girdling knife. It's cut through the bark. You can do this with a, with a, a jackknife or, or anything. And you can do it with a file, a round file. You go through the, the bark and then through the cambium, and you go through the phloem down to the white, which is a xylem. So the xylem is, is like the tree's arterial supply. It's bringing nutrients and water up from the roots into the branches and leaves. The phloem is like our venous system. It's carrying all the metabolites and everything that's formed in the leaves down to the rest of the tree. And you've cut through that. But you've also interrupted the flow of auxin. So now that bud that's in paradormancy is no longer being suppressed by auxin. So what ha happens is in about a week or so, it begins to, to sprout. There's, there's the notch. And then after a few weeks, it has formed. This is in one season. This is in a couple of months, you know, maybe a month. Actually, it says five weeks. So it's, it, the notch is healed completely healed. I have a little marker there so we know where it was in case it didn't develop. And this is a well-developed shoot. And here it is, maybe a few weeks later, as a major scaffold branch. The thing I want you to notice is, uh, here are the other buds. These are, the, these are all its companion buds. They're not moving because the auxin is flowing down and it's suppressing these but the notch has prevented the auxin from flowing over this bud. It has to flow around it. The 
controller of power dormancy has been removed. And since it is summer and is warm and light, that bud immediately sprouts. Critical to know what's happening with your pruning cuts also and with notching. Here's the, the limb later on in that same season. And it's now a major limb in that tree. Can you use this in other circumstances? Well, of course. Here is a an espalier uh, apple. This is goes all along a whole block in a school between the uh, schoolyard and the and the sidewalk. It's missing a branch here. Well, you can live with it if you want, but you can notch it. There are ways you can force the bud to supply a missing branch, and this happens no matter what deciduous tree you're trying to sculpt or shape or form scaffold limbs. Here's a very, very good slide. This was in the second one of our Master Gardener um, newsletters. This, Unfortunately, this is a key page, but it was left out. And uh, it has a, a critical piece of information in it. So this is a little school uh, in um, East Pasadena. That's Huntington Hospital, the backside of it. It's a sidewalk. This is a one-acre school orchard, beautiful little orchard with a lot of vegetable beds. Well, they didn't think they had room for an apple, apple trees in the garden because the apple trees will shade out the other and, and spread all over and, and will take up a lot of room. This is a row of compact or high density line of 25 plus apple trees. It takes up less than three feet of space along the sidewalk fence at the Waverly School Farm. It was planned, planted, trained, and pruned by the orchard team with the kids and parents of this school. The school has an annual cider festival. This past fall, they had a great harvest. They had a fresh eat, eating apple for each of 500 students. They filled 50-gallon jugs with fresh squeezed cider. They filled 24-quart bottles of apple pie filling and had four more baskets of apples for the parents and visitors, which are a tremendous number who come for the cider festival. These were planted as bench grafts. That's the size of a number two yellow eagle pencil. And they grew to the top of the fence in the first season, but they had no side branches. So what we did was at the end of that season, in the, in the winter, each child got a rat tail file and we filed every other, we, a notch in every other bud on the two sides of each one one of these trees. And in the spring, they all budded out. Unfortunately, these were planted on, on, um, on not on dwarfing rootstock, on regular vigorous rootstock. And we had one hell of a job pruning these in the second and third season. And I think Jeff was one of the pruners and he can corroborate that, that they were, they're very vigorous growers. But the important thing about this is this what it mean, this is what it means to adapt commercial techniques to small orchards. So we can use the techniques that high density orchards use all up and down the coast. Most of the orchards planted in the, in the last 20 years are high density in New York, Michigan, uh, Oregon, Washington. And this is the way they do it. They don't do it with files, they do it with Maxell, but we can do the same thing. Here's what happens when you get all these branches horizontally. You get a tremendous fruit production. It's very easy to take care of them. Disease management, picking, everything. When a, when a branch gets to within 50% diameter of the trunk, it's cut, which stimulates the epicormic nodes and you get a new fresh branch. So the things they learn that require chemicals we can do with our simple tools. Well, how about making a bud graft? How does auxin control and influence four season grafting? Although in the California rare fruit growers, we primarily emphasize forms of cleft grafting, which you can do in the dormant season. Tea bud grafting is really the world standard. So here's our tea cut underneath the uh, phloem and cambium. And here is a little paradormant bud. We can do that any time of year because these axillary buds, this is a petiole, are kept dormant by the auxin, but they're, they're very much alive and they're ready to go. When we do June budding in the coastal part of the county, seven days later, we transect the stem three and a half inches above bud. If, however, there are no leaves above or below the bud, instead of transecting it, we cripple it. Most of you know what that is. We, we break the branch and bend it down below the grafts. Now we know that auxin is controlled by gravity. No auxin is going to flow and inhibit our little bud. But 
the leaves remain on the remainder of that uh, rootstock and will supply carbohydrate and nutrients for the little growing bud. 10 to 14 days later, the stem is transected one half inch above the bud. We are now out three weeks from the budding date. We remove the budding rubber. When the new shoot reaches 10 inches, we remove all shoots and suckers. So this technique allows auxin to protect the bud from leafing out before an adequate callus and preliminary vasculature has developed. Now, a lot of people I notice, they, they do a beautiful bud graft, but then they cut the rootstock up here. And of course, that removes the auxin. So the bud, the bud can be stimulated even with the rudimentary vasculature, but it's not really ready to grow and it just dies. So this technique allows the auxin to protect the bud from leafing out. It also permits continued photosynthesis in the remainder of the specimen and then encourages growth of the spout. sprout. All right, we're going to the last few gibberellins. What do gibberellins do? Well, they promote cell elongation, cell enlargement, cell division. They keep track of the photo period. A lot of growth retardants act in many instances by blocking gibberellin because Gibberellin uh, is what increases the int intranodal distance. In fact, when they pan plant trees under power lines, if when the tree is grown to a pretty good height, they spray it with a gibberellin antagonist. And so the, the nodes then become very uh, narrow at the top until the tree reaches its, its predetermined height, but it's going to remain short. The rest of the tree looks entirely normal. If you counteract gibberellin, then you allow the internodal distance to, uh, to improve and increase. Gibberellin also facilitates fruit set, and that's kind of critical. Some gibberellins released by the developing fruit seeds can suppress the downstream flower development and fruit size, and they promote alternate bearing. So this is an important reason why we need to control the gibberellins. And the this slide I put in because it's really important to know that the use of the, the hormones requires registration and pesticide certification. And that's why we can't teach it, uh, the use of the chemical hormones in the Master Gardener program. Uh, I, I also mentioned that synthetic gibberellins are widely used in agriculture and in fruit tree management. And we've already mentioned that sprayed by helicopter in uh, Riverside, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County it will increase avocado production dramatically. This particular organically derived gibberellin is registered in California and approved for both conventional and certified organic productions. How do we control the adverse effects of gibberellin in our small orchards? Well, we do it by thinning. Once the, the young clusters of fruit begin to form seeds, they begin to form gibberellin, which goes down the branch. And what it does, this is what protects the tree against overproduction. It then helps the fruit abscess in uh, late spring, maybe in uh, it's called June fruit drop, but it's actually actually occurs in May. Uh, and here's what we do. We thin peaches and nectarines down to one per hand width. This is a this is a single pass through this beautiful uh, uh, early peach tree. So thinning is a most important orchard practice. It's often neglected. It leads to small fruit. When, it, when you're not thinning, and alternate bearing. So what happens is that the, the, the tree knows genetically that it's, it's producing too much fruit for the carbon dioxide or carbohydrate index, which is how much reserves it has of nutrients. And so what it does, it drops the fruit itself, but it, it drops it randomly. And the point is that the gibberellin produced by these seeds tries to protect the tree for the following season to allow it to have mostly vegetative growth rather than fruit growth. And so that's what gives rise to alternate bearing. And when we thin it ourselves to the fruit that we want and protect it from this over influence of gibberellin, we reduce the likelihood of, of um, alternative bearing dramatically. This is that same tree. You get If you want to get good sized fruit that's healthy, you have to thin. This is in a, in a school orchard. It's an excellent uh, peach because it's ready in mid-May before the school's let out. The same thing has to be done in, in apples. They usually, if it's a good, healthy tree, it'll produce five apples. It should be thin to either one, the king apple, or, or two that are widely spaced, or you get the same problem. Now, the last hormone is ethylene, and ethylene is uh, what causes a 
fruit to ripen. Uh, remember, when fruit is matured, it's not ripe. There are two separate categories. An avocado is ripe on the tree, but it's not mature. It's it's mature on the tree, excuse me, but it's not ripe. You can't eat it unless you uh, take it down and, and store it for a couple of weeks for enough ethylene to accumulate. Same thing is true of, of European pears. You can't eat them off the tree. An Asian pear, you can. So that you, in, in post-harvest, it's very important to know about the action of ethylene. So it, it is involved in the transition of fruit being physiologically mature, meaning its seeds can sprout, to being ripe. It also prepares the fruit for abscission and enhances the final coloration. And the thing that a uh, professional orchardist user is ethophon, which releases ethylene. So one application in a walnut orchard enables the farmer to remove the walnuts with a single shaking. That's called a once over harvest. Folks like us and small orchard growers use very well-known techniques to stimulate ethylene and ripen our homegrown or stored purchased fruit. Retain is a commercial product which is used to block ethylene and prevent premature fruit drop. It's used among other actions to control the harvest date. So an orchardist can see how his fruit is developing and know when he's, his date comes up at the packing house and can delay the abscission of the fruit by counteracting ethylene. Why do we put these unripe fruit in a bag, a paper bag? Well, these are climacteric fruit. They form huge amounts of ethylene while they're on the tree. These will not ripen off the tree very readily. They have very little, uh, and you have to wait for the ethylene to accumulate. And these are the different classes. This is very high, more than 100, uh, these are units, uh, of ethylene, cherry moya, Mame, apple, passion fruit. That's why if you take a slice of apple and put it in with um, some tropical fruits and try to ripen them or avocados, the ethylene given off by the apple is enough to move that tree from maturity to ripeness. It's very interesting. Ethylene is, is also produced by burning. It, it occurs in smoke. And uh, during the recent fires in uh, Ventura, People noted, but probably didn't understand why fruit was dropping off the tree, while the cherry moyas were actually ripening two to three weeks before their usual and predicted date, and were actually abscissing, dropping off the tree. Actually, Ben Faber, who's the, the farm advisor there, knew that it was because of the ethylene in the smoke. It also affects the ground crops. It has effects on lettuce and uh, many of the greens, but that's another story. But these are, these are observations, actually, that were already made in biblical times. And in India, in, in the uh, prehistoric, not prehistoric, but in the early parts of several centuries ago, they used burning uh, bales of, of uh, straw to ripen their mangoes. And uh, they didn't recognize what was coming out in the smoke, but they knew that it would help ripen fruit fast. And we've lost sight of a lot of those things because we're, we're much more fascinated in our mechanical age. So now I'm going to tell you a little story, and then we're concluding. So, uh, you know, we've gone very rapidly. I wanted this to be a survey so that you have some understanding of how important uh, knowing about these hormones is. So I wondered if I successfully made the point. Research and new understanding of the plant hormones enables the spectacular results of precision orchard culture. Can we, using the same knowledge, replicate this on a human scale with a sense of accomplishments and satisfaction in the care of our backyard orchards? Well, a quote by Yves Chouinard occurred to me, and uh, he's the, uh, the one who uh, founded uh, Patagonia. The more you know, the less you need. Can we accomplish anything like this uh, 10,000 an hour helicopter spraying pro jib plus, which is the gibberellin in avocado orchards with a little tool? Well, I recalled a couple of slides and a little backyard orchard story that might just illustrate the simple message. Will this increased understanding of the plant hormones better inform our horticultural techniques in our home orchards? You be the judge. And just remember that the accumulation of gibberellin helps fruit set. So I was called to see a charming lady with a lovely holiday avocado tree in her backyard orchard. Best avocados we've ever tasted, her husband said. But not a single avocado in seven years. Please come and see us. We're ready to cut it down. Here's the dwarf. 
normally occurring dwarf, it's a UC cultivar, holiday avocado, beautiful tree. I looked over it. Usually we can tell why a tree isn't producing fruit. There's disease and maybe phytophthora, the roots aren't good. There's, there's a, a nutrient deficiency. This tree was as healthy as I've ever seen it. And uh, I just didn't understand it. Well, I called Ben Faber, who's an avocado expert, and we discussed what we might do. And he said, maybe we need to concentrate some of the hormones in one branch and see what happens. So he says, why don't you girdle it? So here's the branch I picked, major branch of this tree. And here I'm girdling it with this girdling knife. Here's a completed girdle. It's just like notching. It's going through the bark, cambium, phloem, leaving the xylem. So this limb can continually be nourished, but it can't lose any, can't produce anything, metabolites or hormones that are going to go into the rest of the tree until it heals. That's the completed girdle. All right. I didn't hear from her for over a year. And then Ben was going to lecture at a master gardener meeting at Huntington. And I thought, oh, I'm going to see him. I better find out what happened. So I sent her an email. How are things going? Did anything happen? And she sent out a two-word email reply. We're pregnant. And I thought, well, I better go out and see what's going on. So I went to visit her. You could see she's about five feet tall. This is her holiday avocado. And if you can see the ye slight yellowing there, I don't know how well the color is, but this is in full bloom. My girdle is long since healed. And she had these two lovely avocados. And she said, well, here, these are for you. And I thought, oh, well, it's better than, better than nothing. But I said, no. But you keep them. You haven't had any avocados from that tree in seven years. And she said, no, 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 we, got, we, we harvested some avocados. Why don't you come into the kitchen? And I'll get you a paper bag and you can take these. So we went into the kitchen. And that's the kitchen table. Well, I hope that brings us to the conclusion. I hope that we've had time for some questions, and I certainly appreciate your attention. And I also hope that you found the one hour worthwhile. So many thanks. Yeah, the question, great talk. Uh, you girdled, you go all the way around the tree, the entire branch. Uh, yeah, let me just get this thing off my screen here. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, when you girdle a branch, you go around the entire circumference. Uh, and you, you only want to do one branch at a time because you're, de you're uh, denying the rest of the tree from the metabolites of that branch. You don't want to do a whole bunch of branches. This is a technique that's used really extensively. When I was a kid traveling around, you know, student backpacking around France, I noticed in the orchards there would be girdled limbs, and the farmers would try and grow at least one limb of supersized uh, fruit uh, for the, the uh, fall market or the, the county fair or whatever it is, or for a special purchase. So this is a technique that's been used for generations, but we, we kind of lost sight of it because we, we're chemically oriented, but we can do this. We can that's increase great. the size of fruit and we can stimulate growth and we can stimulate bud setting. I hope that answers the question. One other question, just a quick one. And, I well, let me add one other thing. If, if it works, you can do successive branches in successive years because the girdle heals, as you saw in the notching example. It heals within, certainly well within a month and, and restores the normal circulation. I had a three-in-one apple that I uh, cut back a lot of cover. It was getting very little sun. And this happened in October. So it's actually got a bunch of apples on it now, which is crazy. So I'll probably take them all off. I think I've got the cycle out of whack, but it had no sun on it. So it finally got some sun and then it just bloomed like a month ago. And now there's these little apples about this big on everything. So I'll probably take them all off, right? Because they're not going to last. A absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, that's happened to me as well. That's why you want to save your structural pruning for late winter. You want to wait till a tree is solidly dormant. I mean, in, in most of most, uh, the fruit bearing areas you begin pruning in late february just before before bud break uh you know before the buds begin to swell but not early in the in the winter and not not in the late summer because you're always going to stimulate flowering and uh those flowers are not going to be pollinated or it's going to start getting very cold and i've had branches with with lots of fruit on it yeah, the best thing to do is to pull those all off because you want to save all those reserves of carbohydrate and metabolites that the tree is trying to store for spring when it's going to leaf out because all that 
all that material that you're now pumping into the apples should be stored in the trunk and the roots. And that's why if you look at, at root specimens uh, in, in August and then look at them again in October, you can see they're beginning to swell. And by, uh, by October, the, the roots are swollen with uh, carbohydrates, all kinds of, of sugars. And in the northern climates, that acts as a, uh, an antifreeze and actually prevents them from, from uh, the damage of very cold weathers, weather. But also, when spring comes, all of that is then translocated back into the branches and buds because the tree has no other source of carbohydrate to run the machinery. And that's why in, in uh, late February, you can tap the trees in May and in, in Maine or upstate New York or Ontario and get the sap, uh, the maple syrup. That's everything being mobilized from the trunk and, and, uh, and roots and being translocated back into the scaffold. So you, anything you can do to encourage that to occur is going to give you a much better uh, leaf out in spring and budding and flowering in spring. Anything that interferes with that is going to have an inhibitory effect. Thank you. Mr. Herb, thanks so much for your presentation. It was amazing. Um, on the girdling, <laughs> uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, can girdling be done on any plant? Like I have a, a moringa and you just said something about um, um, for, for winter time. The moringa does not like cold and so i always find that it it's um it's going down it's just like you know i wrap stuff around this bark it could i girdle anything to um help translocate everything that needs to be where it goes when it gets cold what tree what kind of tree is that a moringa you know you don't want to you don't want to girdle a tree in late summer or after cropping or in the fall or winter season, because it's not going to heal very well. And also, uh, it's going to prevent the tree from translocating all of these metabolites into the, uh, into the roots and, and uh, scaffold system. What, what you want to do is save that for when the tree has either budded out or is forming fruit. Uh, usually, we do it when the tree has already formed fruit and uh, when the fruit is, is starting to enlarge. That's the point where you want to conserve uh, metabolites. Now, we did it in this avocado tree early on because we were, we were trying to stress the tree and trying to really get it to start uh, forming buds and fruit. But ordinarily, you only want to do that in a limb where you're trying to increase fruit size or to improve blossom set in that limb. So it's something you use very sparse, you know, very sparingly. Okay. Thank you. I, I think the, it, the proper pruning is the key towards changing the scaffolding and rearranging the tree, best done in the winter months. But studying the tree and deciding where you want blossoming out and shoot formation before pruning and then pruning, knowing what the buds will do, whether you want to stimulate epicormic buds, you want to have a, an axillary bud break dormancy, whether you want to have a whole bunch of branches come out, positioning and uh, and pruning are the ways to control the tree, uh, and uh, the girdling is a way to kind of control fruit and maybe to get a new, uh, not girdling but notching it to get new shoots started. Herb, we have some questions in the chat. I was going to bring up at this point. Uh, we have one question: What time of year can you do the branch spreading, like on a plum tree? The branch spreading should be done regularly. Basically, as the tree is forming, you should begin to form the scaffold of the tree. Now, here's something that's very important. Say you're going to, you're going to do an espalier. I'll use that as an example. You don't want to spread the limbs and branches and laterals too quickly because that suppresses growth. So you want to, if you want to develop fruiting buds, and continue vegetative growth, you spread the branches maybe to 45 degrees, but not to 60. And that's why that angle is critical. You want there to be enough of the hormone oxygen in the bud to keep that branch growing. But also you want to begin to stimulate flower buds in the lower down uh, buds and also maybe 
stimulate some laterals because that's where the fruit buds are going to form, not in the major scaffold branches. So the positioning is really critical. And when you understand that the, uh, the angle between 45 and 60 degrees is critical. Above, if you have a narrower angle than 45 degrees, you're going to get increased vegetative growth. If you put it to 60 degrees, you're going to be suppressing growth, but encouraging bud growth and sprouting and flower buds along the upper surface of that shoot. And, and whether it's a shoot growth or flower growth is really going to depend on your sunlight hitting that branch. So that should be done. You have to be very judicious when you're doing that. Certainly, if, you're, if your tree has reached uh, a good scaffold size by the end of the season in winter, when you can see the branches and see the, see the architectural form of the tree is the best time to do your spreading. So I would, and the short answer would be after leaf drop, because then you, you're able to see what you're dealing with and you can position the, the branches appropriately. And there may be two branches, nice branches that you want in an apple tree, for example, mm -hmm. that are right above one another. And what, what you want to do is you want to you wanna move them out by tying them down to a stake, tying one out like that. After they stay in that position for maybe a month or two or by spring, that's the way they'll stay forever. So you don't have to keep the, the spreading or the, or the positioning for many seasons. But, but what you wanna do in winter is to try and get those branches so that the, one isn't shading the other or else they're too crowded and you're gonna compromise your cropping. Uh, and that's why in the, in the apple tree, you have whorls. You have one row of like, like the spokes of a, of a wagon wheel uh, about two or three feet off the ground where it's easy to, to reach, but not low enough that the fruit's going to hang on the ground. And then you let that branch grow during the summer for another foot or two, 14 inches. And then you, let the, you cut it and you let the epicomic buds form a whole nother group of spokes but you position those alternately with the ones in the lower scaffold. I hope that's clear. So they're not shading. You can even go up to a third whorl if there's enough distance. That's why these, uh, these ever-growing buds sort of uh, are so important in forming this scaffold because you can continue to manipulate it all through the summer and then do your final positioning in the winter when you can see everything uh, bare of leaves. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question. This is one about fruit thinning. Uh, be, uh, uh, besides fruit thinning, is, is there anything we can do to prevent alternate fruiting or alternate bearing? Uh, in, in citrus, uh, which, which has some of the wonderful citrus have very significant alternate bearing, a huge crop one year and maybe a little basket. Uh, it happens in, in Golden Nugget. I don't know whether it happens in Yosemite Gold and, and Shasta Gold, but certainly in, in um, uh, Gold Nugget. You'll get, you may get 20 or 30 one year and, and five, 10 basket loads in the, in the second. If you prune it back so that you start getting new limb growth, you'll begin to change the seasonal variation that the tree has gotten used to. And that's one of the keys uh, in pruning. You can also um, accomplish uh, a, an abolition of, of uh, alternate bearing. But the one key for everybody uh, that is not used sufficiently and not really recognized and not done early enough is thinning. What, what people always say, when do you thin? Well, basically in a commercial orchard, you thin after the blossoms have been fertilized, but they can recognize uh, blossoms that have been pollinated and those that aren't. So they can fine tune it. Also, you can use some, uh, some chemical thinning, uh, which, which is very, very effective, but um, chlorothalonil. But I think the best is hand thinning. And because then you can put the fruit where you want it. You can be sure there's enough room that they're not, re not rubbing, that they're going to get adequate sunlight. But the time to thin is before the seeds begin to form, because that's when the gibberellin is formed. So basically, when a, for us who can't recognize that readily that this blossom is, is fertilized and, uh, or pollinated, this one isn't, I'm going to pull this one off. When the fruit reaches pea size, that's a good time to do your thinning uh, for, for most any kind of fruit. And there will be some fruit drops still because it depends on how well the tree is satisfied with your fertilization management. 
But basically, there's something called a carbon index that is built into the tree's genetics that let it know when there is adequate reserves to ripen the fruit that has been fertilized, that has been pollinated. Because this is going to vary from year to year, depending on pollinators, depending on how wet the spring was. So the tree has this mechanism to each year judge the fruit set and decide what it can safely maintain without jeopardizing its health and survival. And that's why it will drop. Uh, most citrus will drop 90 to 92 percent of the blossoms that are set because we've got lots of pollinators here. And we usually have a, a pretty dry spring. So that's a, a normal mechanism that the tree has. And the way we can control it, because the tree is now not growing in its in its regular environment, and it, we could probably carry more fruit than it could in a season that's much shorter. And the way we do that is by thinning, hand thinning. So that that's the key. Great. Um, there are a couple of girdling questions are both really short. How do you know how far or deep to cut in a girdle? And is there a season limitation on girdling? Yeah, yeah uh, you only want to girdle, basically you want to girdle a tree, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. For example, in the little orchard I showed you where we wanted to get lots of side branches, we did this in, in early spring, which in late February. I forgot the exact time we did it. We, we, we looked carefully at the Simmer Station data, and we girdled it just before the tree would be ready to blossom, uh, sh form shoots, bud out, when the, the buds were just beginning to swell. And then we girdled it so that the suppression would be gone. So that that's, a, that's a good time to girdle or, or in early summer if you're trying to form a new limb or a new branch or a new lateral in an espalier or in a particularly ornamental fruit tree that you have. Uh, so the best time is just before the buds would ordinarily break. So, uh, your, you so your girdle it, doesn't have- some more, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so your girdle doesn't have a chance to- I, mean, I just want to add, add one more thing, just so that your girdle doesn't have a chance to, uh, to heal before, vigorous budding starts, but you don't want to do it in winter. So you want to do it during the growing season. Does the tool you use make it easy to judge the depth that you're cutting into the tree? Oh, the depth. Yes. Uh, you, you want to wait till you get to the xylem. You don't want to cut the xylem. So the xylem is the wood, but also the first couple layers of the xylem are still active vascularly. So ba basically your cambium is, is forming the vascular system of that uh, shoot. It's forming, or well, that limb, it's, it's forming a new phloem every year, which accounts for the rings you see when you transect it. It's also, there's also a bark forming cam cambium, and there's a xylem forming cambium that's on the inside. So basically you cut down till you've removed the green. When you begin to see the absolute white, no green, no green in your in your notch, you're down to the xylem, and you want to leave that. You don't want to cut into uh, through the heartwood. You don't want to cut to the heartwood. That that uh, white xylem that you see underneath the green cambium and phloem layer is the sapwood. That's carrying a lot of the nutrients, and you want to leave that intact. Uh, it's it, it varies depending on the thickness of the bark and how rapidly the tree is growing, but that's where it generally will peel. So if you cut a, a two horizontal uh, cuts and a vertical cut and you, and you begin to lift it up with your fingernail or, or, or the end of a file, you'll see that's where it will peel out. Generally, that's a, a good separation layer, particularly during the growth season because there's a lot of fluid there. And um, normally that's, that's when you wanna do some uh, T-bud grafting because it's very easy to then separate the, the the bark and the cambium from the underlying xylem. So it's white. Question, when is the good time to do the budding, the bud grafting or cleft grafting for for navel or for citrus? Is there any good time? Well, if you're using certified budwood, I have to mention that Jeff is the expert there. We don't want to spread any disease, so we're very very careful. Uh, and, and we don't do any budding from uh, 
local material. We we send away, it's very inexpensive, to the University of California out in Link Cove and, and get certified budwood. Uh, that is best done, like avocado trees, best done just before budding out. So if you know your tree uh, and you see that, that buds are beginning to swell and it's going to begin to leaf out, that's the time to do bud grafting because the tree is prepared to do that. If you do it when it's, when it's, it's dormant, and, and these trees do go dormant, but it doesn't look like dormancy of the uh, deciduous trees, but it's less likely. It, the bud may heal, and, and ver nurseries very often do that because they want to work around the year. But then it's it, what you've done, if you've done bud grafting in the wrong season, it's called a, a sleeping eye. So they'll sell you a budded, a grafted tree that has no side branches, but it has a, has a graft on it because they know it's healed properly and it looks good and it'll bud out in spring. So that it's uh, the season is, is very important. Many other things will, will bud out as soon as you remove the auxin suppression. But, but the best time to do that in, in these uh, subtropical trees is when they're ready to do their own budding out just before that, maybe a week or two before that, so your bud, your graft has a chance to heal. So it can be done in any season where you've got the appropriate stage between your rootstock and your grafting material. You don't want grafting material that's in spring and and uh, rootstock that's, that's totally dormant because it's just not gonna, not gonna work. If the rootstock is growing and the bud is dormant, you're good to go. It's safe to draft bud from your own navel tree to another. Like I have a grapefruit tree I want to graft. I can take my navel or Valencia and graft on it, right? It's safe. I don't need to buy commercial buds in my garden. Yeah. Horticulturally, that's fine. Yeah. All citrus can be, can be, uh, budded. Pardon? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Citrus, all apples can be budded to other apples. They're all compatible. And for the most part, citrus are too. Other, other categories, you have to be very careful and you have to do a little research. But apples, generally, any two cultivars or varieties. Remember, a cultivar is a, is a, is a variety that has been cultivated. It's not occurring naturally, whereas a variety is the natural variation of the fruit. Uh, so that in apples, any cultivar, any variety can be can be cross budded, and the same thing is generally true of citrus. I have one other question. Uh, I have an avocado tree. It's about five years old. It's about seven feet tall. It's never really produced. It's a forte. I'm thinking of doing that ring cut that you mentioned on one of the branches. It, it may help. Your thoughts? I mean, I could do it now. <laughs> Yes, when I when I discussed this with with um, with Ben Faber, who's really very extraordinarily knowledgeable about about everything, but especially subtropicals and avocados, he said that it's not unusual for individual avocado trees to have a period of of fruit bearing dormancy, and I I never really understood what, why that was. There are a lot of environmental characteristics, or also in, in in trees that have been hybridized and bred and come from different nurseries or on all kinds of different rootstock. Strange things like that do happen. There may, there may be some hormonal imbalance between the, the, the uh, pits that were used to form the rootstock, uh, unless this is, this is genetically determined rootstock. And so he thought that girdling is a good way to stimulate that. And very often, if you girdle one limb to provide some stress and, and concentration of metabolites and hormones, when that girdle heals, that limb is apt to discharge that to the rest of the tree. So very often, you'll get fruit set in many branches, even though you've only girdled one. That's kind of curious, but uh, but yeah, I, I would I would do that because it, he thought it was a very good way to jumpstart uh, fruit set. And I just need awesome. a quarter, about an eighth inch slice all the way around, get through the green, right? Not just down to the cat, just down to the white. Say that one. Say that once again, because I, I, my, I just my, need a, like my computer a quarter cut inch, out for a minute. I need about a quarter inch or eighth of inch ring around the tree, down to where it's white, right? 
Yes. Yeah. See, yeah, yeah. Quarter inch is fine. Yeah. Depending on the size of the, of the shoot or branch, you're, you're, um, yeah, the, the, you want it to be, you don't want it to be huge because then it takes a long time to heal and it's a site for uh, insect infestation. So about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch will allow enough time for whatever's going to happen to happen and then the healing to take place fairly rapidly. But trees in vigorous periods of growth will heal a cut like that very quickly. Do you and, put white uh, paint, like latex paint on it, or do you just leave it alone? Pardon? Do you put latex paint like over the wound to help it heal, or no? No, no, no. Uh, painting painting of wounds is uh, is is discouraged. What what happens with pruning wounds is within eight to ten hours, the tree, if it's done properly. A nice sharp cut. Your, your your tools are clean and absolutely sharp, so you're not damaging the cells at the cut. When when your pruners can cut a sheet of paper, they're then they're 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 proper. You want to you want to watch the uh, the uh, Los Angeles County Master Gardener video on YouTube on how to sharpen and prune, uh, sharpen and tune your pruning tools when they're sharp and you're not damaging the cells at the area of the cut. Within eight to ten hours, the, the tree has already secreted a uh, serotin, which is a wax material, over that cut, so it's resistant to infestation, and then it begins to heal it very, very slowly from the cambium. But but basically, that begins very rapidly. Unless your tools are dull and you you really have to clamp down, then you're damaging a lot of those cells that are just they're ready to heal. So. Uh, it's very important that the that the tools be sharp and clean, and then the healing takes place. I don't know if that answered it. I kind of got distracted yeah, because that was important. Thank you. And we got a few more things in the uh, chat, Herb, if you got time. All right, go ahead. Okay, Alistair is asking about evergreen trees like longans and mangoes. Are they as likely to are are, are they subject to alternate bearing? Um, you know, I don't know that. Uh, I'm not really an expert on those in that detail on the subtropicals, but I'm sure somebody in in the group will be able to answer that. Maybe Jeff, maybe you can survey whoever's around. I'm not sure whether they do or not. This is a more real botany question here. Is there particular structures in the plant cell that are responsible for the secretion of the hormone, like we have an endocrine system with glands and organs? Well, probably. The answer, general answer would be yes, although uh, plants carry the hormonal ability throughout the tree, the tree, for example, from roots to trunk to it's most active in the in the actively growing parts of the tree. But basically, if you cut a tree down to a stump, the epicormic buds are going to be stimulated. I mean, you you know, if you've tried to eliminate a tree, you cut it down. And uh, even if you, whatever you've done, it'll start sprouting for the, for the most part, because these are vigorous trees and our climate is very conducive to that. So most parts of the tree can produce most of these enzymes and most of the hormones. Remember, a hormone, it's, it, this is maybe a difference between mammals, animals, and, and plants. We only produce hormones in specific, specific glands like the uh, melatonin and the pineal gland, the thyroid hormone and the thyroid gland. And if you remove, you remove that, you remove the source of hormone. That's not strictly true in the plants, although I, I, can't, uh, uh, I can't tell you exactly where every one of these hormones is located. But a lot of these cells are multipotential. So that's why when you expose a shoot to sunlight, these buds on the surface are like stem cells. They're multi-potential. If light hits them, they'll form a flower bud. If they're in the shade, they'll form a shoot bud or they'll form a water sprout. If you cut that shoot and stick it in the ground, moist, and then keep it uh, humidified, it'll form roots. So most of the cells, growing cells in the trees are multi-potential. They're like stem cells. And if you, if you, draw that out, it means that, that each one is capable of producing anything that's produced in the other parts of the tree. And that's why we can do so many of these different things, uh, rooting, um, rooting shoots, rooting hardwood, grafting. Good question. 
Well, Vladimir wants to know what to do about uh, a blueberry plant that's flowering uh, in November, December. So obviously not the right time to be flowering. Yeah, yeah, that, I, 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 yeah. The blueberry, blueberry, there's a lot of blueberry plants that are, are available and, and there's wonderful ones that are lower chill now. There's a difference between the high, high bush, which is what we're trying to plant down here uh, and ones that grow more prostate on the ground. Uh, they have all kinds of, of um, requirement for, uh, for, for chill hours. You've got to look up that particular variety. I mean, the ones here, uh, powder blue, sharp blue, uh, loads and loads of new varieties that are, are coming from Mon Monrovia Nursery. But many of them have different uh, different chill hours required. And, and what, what happens if it blooms out in, in November, it means that it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone dormant. Uh, and you can, you can try and withhold water and try and get it to go into dormancy. But so in, in our area, these trees, these trees will grow all year round. And, and, they, and those blossoms may very well set fruit. And they, they do tend to ripen in cool climates. So I, very difficult to answer that question, except that it it is due to what some of this hormonal balance. I would just watch that bush for a season or two before you do anything drastic. And you may find that you're getting very, very early blueberries. Maybe in February or March, you'll have a whole bush full of them. But remember, they, need, they can't uh, absorb nutrients from the soil that is alkaline. So basically, you may want to acidify your water. Usually a tablespoon of white vinegar in a gallon of water with your fertilizer or just when you're watering them will make sure they stay healthy because it's a root-soil interaction. It's the rhizosphere. If it's acidic, those roots are very comfortable in absorbing nutrients and, uh, and fertilizers. But if it's, if it's seven or above, they just sit there. The tree may, it, the bush may look healthy, but it's not going to do its whole uh, seasonal variation of blossoms and, and fruit. So managing the soil uh, pH is critical. And it's very hard. You can acidify the soil in a, in a plot with, with sulfur or with um, uh, oak leaf mulch or um, uh, perennial evergreen needles you got or, or peat but it's very hard to acidify alkaline soil you can do it to a certain extent but the soil has tremendous buffering qualities it's and the best way to do it is to acidify the water that you're using but that may may get this the, the bush back into a normal seasonal pattern well, Kathy wants to know a little bit more about your avocado example. She says she understands that the girdling stressed the avocado and that it caused it to fruit. But what do you think? Why wasn't the, the tree fruiting normally over the over that period of seven years? Any guesses? Well, Ben Faber didn't know. <laughs> and that, to me, that's like a, that's like I went to church and prayed, and that's the answer I got. <laughs> he may he may only you know he may not be the smartest uh farm advisor in the world but if there is i don't know who it is and he he says it happens and uh he had just come back from turkey where he, he had established their avocado industry there uh so i don't know where else you can look to get an answer to that question it's very perplexing and, and that's why i this is the first time we've ever talked about the plant hormones as a group because a lot of this information is just just coming out the the spraying of the uh of the avocado trees with gibberellin is it's just been studied actually over the past three or four years from you see your riverside so this is an evolving this is an evolving area but i think you, you've got a taste of it but as far as me knowing everything about it uh you know i spent my time at, at UCLA and John Wooden, who was the, the coach of our very famous basketball teams that won one national uh, na national title after another. His, one of his favorite sayings is, what you learn after you know everything is the most important. <laughs> so I, I just try, try to keep learning. And I, I can't answer that question really. And it perplexes me.
<laughs> That's a good answer anyway. Hey. Uh, <laughs> hey Herb, do, do you have any um do you have any advice for me? I have two um olive trees at my um school garden and um I've been there for four years and last year it gave me a lot of um a lot of, of olives and I treated the ground as a season tree. There are two season trees, but it, your pruning that you were saying, we don't really cut back. I do low hanging cutting, um, but we don't do anything to the tree. And um, this, this two, well, last year I had my kids, you know, pull all olives down and we, we brine the olives, but we got nothing this year at all, like zero. Can you tell me what, I could do to be more regular? Yes, uh, you're, you cut out on me several times. I mean, it's an olive tree that's growing in a pot or, no, or, it, or it, no. in a pot. They're not in the pot. They're in a, um, you know, they're in a parking lot and there's a, the, um, the, you know, like the strip of land there between the actual parking spaces and you know, going into the building. And so it's got enough space and it's it's a se two season trees. The, the, the church, I mean, the school has been there for over 40 years, but I've been there for four years. And uh, last year we got a lot of, we got a lot of olives and I had been treating them since I've been there. And um, I didn't do the, anything the first two years of, of actually pulling down olives, but I've been treating the ground and um, cutting them for the low hanging branches. Um, but I didn't get anything at all this year. And I was prepared to do so much brining and, and I got bupkis. What are you, what are you adding to the ground? Um, well, what are you I, treating the ground with? Well, I treated it with um, compost that, you know, we, we have a chef and so I did the full on compost. I do um, coffee grinds. I do um, eggshells. Um, I roast the eggshells and then I crush them. And then I kind of made a circle around the bottom of the tree and put it in there. And um, I cut away all the um, suckers at the bottom. Okay. Uh, can you still hear me? Because I got to notice that my bandwidth, people are turning on their appliances and my bandwidth is... is I can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'm not absolutely sure, but I'll tell you the things that suppress uh, flowering and, and fruiting are people very often will feed the tree with a lot of nitrogen. Uh, I don't think you have, but nitrogen will suppress uh, fruit development. It, it, it stimulates uh, vegetative growth, but it, it suppresses fruit formation. So, uh, in fact, most orchards use very only the amount of nitrogen that's going to be removed from the tree by harvesting the fruit. The tree I may have gone into alternate bearing. I think you're going to have to watch it through several seasons. I, I'm not sure why it would have a big crop one year and not, and not the next, unless this is a, a pattern. But basically, you want to be very careful with nitrogen. The other thing is when you put compost, which has, which has no nitrogen in it, and if the compost hasn't been thoroughly composted, it's going to suck nitrogen out of the soil to, comp to continue composting whatever it is in it that isn't completely reduced to humic acid. So you got to be careful what you're adding to the soil of this. I would, I would, I would do a little research on what kind of fertilization a, a producing olive tree needs and don't do anything else. The other thing is you're going to have to watch it through several seasons. Uh, be sure it's adequately watered. Uh, ones that grow in a pot very, very rapidly encircle the pot, and you've got to root prune them uh, every, at least every three years to get normal growth and normal uh, seasonal changes. But I'm not sure, but I would check what you're doing and also watch it for a few seasons before you decide that it's not going to bear olives. It may have a very heavy, uh, a very heavy crop in the following year. I don't know. Watch the buds. Okay, thank you so much. It's in the ground. Okay. It's not in the pot. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Then be careful about what you're putting there. Some, If you're not putting completed compost, if you're putting something on the ground that requires further degradation, then you're sucking and it's not nitrilized. I mean, a lot of these uh, ground covers and, uh, and mulch will say on the bag that it's been nitrilized. That means it an amount of nitrogen has been added to the to that mulch to not 
steal nitrogen from the tree. So you got to be very careful. Other things are going to find nitrogen wherever it is to complete their bacterial requirement for, for um, reducing the compost to humic acid. So be careful about what you're putting. You may want to just stop uh, treating it so good. <laughs> <laughs> give it, give it a little, give it a little stress. Yeah, you're right. I call it Zachariah one and Zachariah two. So it's like oh, I, I, yeah. th I think you're, a, I think you're a very good nursemaid. That's you got to be stressing a little bit. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a pomegranate tree. Uh, it I have a lot of flowers but most of them get shed off. And the f even the one or two fruits I get, they're very sour. Any solution? What, what kind of tree is that? is that again? I'm sorry. A pomegranate. Okay. Pomegranates are usually pretty productive in this area. Again, remember that many of these trees are alternate bearing. So but basically when you have this change, you need to watch it through a few seasons. Uh, has it ever fruited a lot of pomegranates? No, finally I get only one or two and they're not, they're very sour. And also they, it gets rotten on the flower side. They get what on the flower side? It gets rotten, it gets. Oh, well. Yeah, well, there there is blossom end rot, which which can occur in trees as well as in tomato plants. I think the thing you, you want to look at is the, the nutrition. You might want to, if this is an important tree and this crop is important to you, uh, I would spend $50 and get a leaf analysis and a soil analysis and see what's deficient. It sounds like it's probably a deficiency because the tree looks otherwise healthy, then it should be producing fruit. The other thing, the fact that it's rotting at the blossom end suggests that there, there may be some disease in the tree. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, it doesn't come to mind exactly what that might be, but uh, there could be several things that are going wrong. Well, one thing you can do when you're, when you're only getting a few fruit, uh, very often when that happens in apples, it's, it's a deficiency of calcium. So that most, most apple orchards, very much like you treat your tomato plants, are sprayed with calcium to get uh, canopy or leaf absorption. But I think if it's an important tree and you need the crop, uh, it's not just an ornamental tree. I would, and it had, and, and it it has been a tree that has bloomed and set fruit. You need to look at the nutrition. The best thing to do would be to get a soil analysis. And if that doesn't tell you what's wrong, to do a leaf, leaf analysis. A lot of laboratories will do those two together. Um, but that's where I would start, unless there's some obvious disease. And then you might want to take that to the nursery where you got it and ask them whether they have encountered that and what they would recommend you treating the tree with. I went and did a soil analysis at my place, and I did four different spots, and they're all 7.5 pH. So I had tons of nutrients, but my... My soil is very alkalitic, um, so I think I was shocked to find that out, and I'm adding sulfur to it to slowly change the pH. Yeah, what, what I would do is, is, is very difficult. I, I think you can. The sulfur does have a, have a transient acidifying effect, but to change the, the, the entire ground, you know, if, if it's a, an average backyard, it might take a 500 pounds to a, a half a ton of sulfur, really, to get a big change in the pH. Remember, the soil has a lot of buffering capacity. I would try and isolate areas that need it and then uh, till in a lot of uh, oak leaf um, uh, oak, oak leaf mulch, uh, decomposed oak leaf, um, peat, peat moss, which is acidic, and uh, also uh, pine pine tree uh, needles where you can go to a place where the leaves are, needles are shedding and get a big basket of those. I think that'll work because it's a slower process, but it'll be more durable and you'll have to conf confine it to an area. If it's already all grown with trees and roots and you can't get that nutrient change into the soil, then changing the, um, the acidity of your, of your watering, uh, access, you might want to check the pH of your water as well. 
But when I was at UC Santa Cruz, we had a, an acre plot experimentally for the uh, for the uh, agricultural uh, study center in, in Davis, and all of our waters was water was passed through a little filter, a bottle that had vinegar in it. And we, we check the pH, but there's, there's ways of adding that to a drip system. So as the water goes in, it picks up a little bit of acetic acid all the time, and the water is acidified. But you, you have to kind of figure that out carefully if, 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 you're back, if your orchard in this area is a long-term kind of investment. Uh, but those, those are some things that will help acidify it, is using organic material or trying to acidify your water, because that's going to affect the tree the most because it's going to be picked up by the roots. That's, that's the best I can say. Usually, if you're going to use sulfur, it should be in a, a new plot where you can actually measure how much sulfur you need, depending on the pH and the area, and till it all deeply into the soil. It's hard to do with an established orchard. So uh, give that some thought. Uh, yeah, and thank ask you. around, see if you get some other opinions. Yeah, thank you. I've got like 65 trees behind my house, and I'm I uh, put the cedar bark in there, which which will acidify it. But I'm kind of like nervous. I added some sulfur, and I noticed one of my trees had died. I thought I'd put too much sulfur on it, but the gophers got it. So the, my navel tree just fell over today, and a gopher had eaten all the roots. So I got that as a challenge as well. <laughs> well, that, that, that suggests whatever you did, that, that suggests whatever you did really helped because you, you established more root growth because the gophers don't go over don't don't go after the dry roots but if you've got a lot of new root shoots coming out uh, you've opened the mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh i think i think it's a that, that's a that's a winsome loosome i think you may have you may have done something very useful and stimulated a lot of root growth, which is the first thing you'd probably see when you're getting the soil pH right, but that attracted attracted the gophers. I think if you have gophers, it's best to plant in in, in a wire basket. Uh, there are a bunch of them that, that are easy to assemble. You don't have to build them all yourself and plant the trees that way. So they're at, at ground level and all around the, the tree. Roots will grow out of it, but there'll be enough roots sustained in that area to maintain the health of the, of the tree and viability of the tree. But I would definitely uh, use use that as a lesson to any new planting should go into uh, yeah. a gopher barrier or basket. I have big baskets I make out of a galvanized uh, mesh and put my five gallon trees in there. Works pretty well. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, just, just to continue this a little bit, uh, John said his soil pH was, I think, 7.5. Is that really alkaline enough to be a problem for most fruit trees? I know it would be for blueberries, but, you know, what about other fruit trees? Yeah, blueberries, you, you have an ornamental bush. Yeah. Uh, 7.5 7 is, is pretty alkaline. Uh, fruit trees, you know, there's something called the rhizosphere. That's the area around the roots. And usually the pH in that very narrow zone is controlled by a, a chemical conversation between the roots and the soil. The roots themselves can acidify soil that are around it to optimize their uptake of nutrients. So this is a, a very dynamic area, uh, the rhizosphere. Um, and... Uh, a lot of trees can accommodate that, uh, if but that is that, that, that is alkaline, and uh, uh, you know what you have to do is is you might want to pick cultivars that are resistant to alkaline soil rather than trying to change all the soil in your in your environment. Uh, I mean, most of our soil in in Southern California is alkaline, but most of it's seven seven point one. Maybe it gets up a little bit higher, but uh, it's generally pretty balanced. Trees do have some leeway, and I think you have to watch the growth. Uh, you may have to plant some seedlings in some in in uh, some small areas as an experimental area, um, because amending the whole site is, is a big job uh, to have that, particularly for fruit trees, which is a very multi-year requirement, and so uh, uh, it makes it more difficult. I think you're going to have to do a little research on that. I, I, my, my tendency would be to try and do a little more research on the 
cultivars that I'm using and find out from the nurseries or the people who are holding the patent or whoever grew that, something like Monrovia or one of the nurseries, and find out how resistant that tree is to that particular pH. Uh, but that is going to impact the growth a little bit and, and the setting of fruit. But trial and error is a very useful technique when you're a hobbyist grower and you're Herb, I think you fell off the line. Yeah, you cut off for me too. Uh, just to give a follow up, I uh, the cherry tree loves a, a alkaline pH. That's the only thing I know that likes alkaline seven five, but all the normal fruit trees need six to seven, and so I'm trying to bring it down slowly. I hope I don't kill my trees, but I'm trying all that stuff he's suggesting. Hi, this is Shelley, and I've been having internet problems too, so I may not have caught the entire question, but. As far as pH, it is largely determined by how much bacterial activity or how much fungal activity there is in the soil. So having a lot of mulch and, and more higher fungal activity changes the acidity in the area, which is easier than using chemicals to change your pH in the soil. So I think that was the question, right? Yeah, it sounds like, yes, Alistair is asking about mycorrhiza and how they might compensate for alkaline soil. And if that's, uh, if that's the case, that, that's great. They're, they're doing the work for you. Right, and pH is, it varies tremendously from area to area. So even within the rhizome, um, it can vary within that. So trying to change how much fungal activity there is in the area is really the best way to make certain nutrients available, which is why you want it to be higher acidity, like in a forest. Um, so having that food available for the fungus is why it changes. So one more great reason to do a lot of mulching around your trees. Yeah. Can you actually buy that stuff? Is it available to mix into your soil, the rhizomes? Um, oh, you could buy, micro you could buy mycorrhiza, but it, choosing the right one is probably the challenge. Uh, because there's different species that associate with different you know, types of trees. So I don't know if that's a good idea or not, because it's usually there. You just need to be supporting it. And if, I, if I can answer that, the, the mycorrhizal thing a little bit. Uh, this is Alistair. The mycorrhizal spores are pretty much added to most of the uh, fertilizer mixes by companies like Job's. If you check the, the descriptions on the package, uh, quite a lot of them nowadays will have uh, so many billion per, per unit of a handful of different mycorrhizal uh, fungi to help to build up the mycorrhizal web. Uh, that's true for composting mixes, it's true for rose mixes, it's true for citrus mixes. Uh, I believe you can only get all the specific spores if you know exactly what you want, but that can be a real challenge. I've had a lot of success with the uh, the, the commercial ones, as I said, Job's was one, and I think Kellogg's does another uh, for their composting mixes. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, I'd like to add one more point to that. Um, thank you, Alice, there. There are two kinds of mycorrhizal, endo, right, and ecto. And you can get supplement powders it comes a small jar it's super expensive and they will sometimes mix the two and also add other things that are useless so you really want to know what kind of um mycorrhizae uh interaction you want does it go into the plant or just surround the, the root, I mean, into the root or around the root. So it's just one more point to consider. You can get gypped if you're not careful. <laughs> That's it. Herb, it looks like you're back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I changed I change access uh, to an old, an old old modem we have. And it looks like it's something sucked out the 
bandwidth of my new one. <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm here. I'm uh, glad to try and answer well, we're about, anything. We're, we're almost wrapped it up. I just uh, do you hear this conversation about mycorrhiza and whether it's a good idea to be adding mycorrhiza into you know around your fruit trees for, for you know for the various benefits you get from mycorrhiza, including maybe acidifying the soil. Yeah. The scientific answer is no, uh, mainly because every time that a commercially available mycorrhiza has been tried experiment, it really doesn't cause any 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 effect. The, the, the reason is that the mycorrhiza in all soils is pretty well established, and what a tree requires is also in a pretty narrow range, and it can it can modify its surrounding environment. The uh, the best thing is to add things that encourage mycorrhiza development in that area, and that's by well composted compost. You're you're putting in the basic material. There there are some mycorrhizas that can be used to counteract specific things like uh, like um, wilt in plants. Uh, this this specific ones that confer immunity to certain of the wilt uh, bacteria. But generally, the commercially available mycorrhiza may be excellent in a soil where that was produced. Uh, and generally, they can tell you what the variety is uh, if if they're if, if they're very uh, meticulous about it. But uh, the general experience, when it's been tested by the uh, farm advisors and the, and the uh, agricultural extension, is that adding it is not is not as beneficial as adding a good comp compost is made up of a variety of materials. And I would do that first before spending a lot of money for something that is very problematic. Um, if you happen to hit it just right, it may work, but you spent a lot of money, uh, whereas you only need a backyard black composter and adding all your stuff. And that's going to enable the root, uh, the roots of your tree to establish this uh, uh, rhizosphere, which is optimal for absorbing nutrients, which what you, which is what you want. I mean, the roots will have holding power, but you want to improve the absorption. Uh, the other thing is, to, if you're having trouble with absorption of certain minerals, the thing is to use chelated minerals, particularly in our area. Uh, absorption of iron is is very poor, even though if you do a soil analysis, there's plenty of iron in our soil, but it's bound. So if you if you use chelated fertilizer, then the 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 mineral is surrounded by an organic shell, uh, which is the meaning of, of the chelation, and it allows it to degrade slowly and allows the root to accommodate, and you get much better absorption. The other thing is if you're if you're missing some element, is to use foliar sprays rather than trying to get the soil tremendously changed. So, I mean, a, a foliar spray is going to be a lot, if you know what the deficiency is, it's going to be a lot less expensive than buying a little one ounces of mycorrhiza for 30 bucks. That, that's the, it's a comp, complex subject, um, but uh, that's the best I can do at the moment. Herb, I, I did, a, I checked my soil analysis for iron on my avocado trees and it was low, it's like five so I, I read about these sprays. You can just spray it like two or three times a year. Is that what you do when the leaves are out? Yeah, yes. The, the best time to, if, if your leaves are actually turning, uh, becoming chlorotic, you have a significant deficiency, then the best thing is to use a foliar spray. Uh, one of the best for avocado and citrus would be citrus growers mix. I think that's one of the companies puts it out very easily accessible. It's not very expensive. It has uh, manganese, iron, and most of the things that are not absorbed well from our soil. The best time to use a foliar spray is after leaf out. So when the young leaves are coming out, they're going to be the most absorbent, and that's the time to use the foliar spray mixed carefully. If the leaves are already older and um, they're already chlorotic, they're not going to change, uh, and you're not going to get much of that chemical into the into the tree itself so at, at leaf out when the leaves are young that's the best time to do it and uh, um, you can correct a lot of these things with soil drenches uh, with chelated minerals but uh, foliar spray is the way to go if you're really experiencing a significant deficiency the leaves that are on the tree are not going to change. They're going to either, you know, either the young leaves are going to be chlorotic if it's a heavy metal, uh, iron or manganese or uh, deficiency, 
Whereas if the new leaves are yellow, you're, you're dealing with a, with a nitrogen deficiency because the nitrogen is, nitrogen is very soluble and should be easily mobilized by the tree. So that can tell you whether you want to go to chelated minerals or to, or to, or to nitrogen. Uh, but again, the leaves that are already formed that are chlorotic are very unlikely to change even if you've corrected the abnormality. So don't use that as a marker that the leaves are still yellow. Look at the newer leaves. The newer leaves now should be coming out green if your iron manganese are being properly absorbed. And if they're not, then foliar spray or switching to chelated minerals or something like citrus growers mix, either sprayed or added to the soil is probably best. Herb Sharon had asked earlier about uh, time, you know, when would you recommend fertilizing what month uh, for your fruit trees? I just say added to that, do you have like a favorite fertilizing regimen you follow uh, for say deciduous fruit trees? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I just mentioned that. Basically the citrus should be fertilized in May and February. Those are the best times in our area. That's the recommendation of, of the uh, agricultural extension. Uh, after a five-year-old tree, after that should be getting a full pound of nitrogen a year, half in May, half in February. Uh, most fruit trees require about a pound of nitrogen a year if they're very productive, because you're that's you're removing quite a bit of that uh, if you're cropping and removing that from the tree. Everything else, prunings, uh, leaves, should be composted. And then anything the tree, anything the tree required to, to build that scaffolding and all those leaves is being reduced to its elemental form and you're returning it. So you only really need to use as fertilizer the things that are being depleted in the fruit or, or something that you're removing. So basically for, for avocado and citrus, uh, master nursery citrus and avocado is the best balanced fertilizer for our area. Um, Grow more ha has very little nitrogen, but a lot of humic acid, and uh, that is a very good fruit tree fertilizer if you're adding some nitrogen into the soil. But you don't want to add that around the time of fruiting because nitrogen is going to suppress the formation of your fruit. So that something like <clears throat> Grow More, um, it's called More Blossom, it comes in a five five pound uh, black granular. Uh, production and and that will supply the other nutrients the uh, p and k and some micronutrients without much nitrogen because you don't want to stimulate vegetative growth when you're trying to get the tree to blossom out so right before the tree is going to blossom out or fruit or shoot out that's the time to put the fertilizer and you put it in in autumn it's going to be washed out by the rain nothing the tree the roots aren't absorbing anything at that point they're dormant so at the end of the season, some people do some fertilizing after cropping when the, when the roots are getting prepared, but not, not during the winter months. And just before the tree is going to leaf out is the best time so that the nitrogen, which is very soluble, isn't washed away by the first rain. So that's the best time for avocado and citrus uh, and uh, the deciduous trees around uh, late February. Uh, when you're beginning your rewatering, that's the time to put the fertilizer in the ground. It's the only time it's going to make any real difference to your growth uh, and and the productivity without suppressing flowering. I hope, I hope that answers it. But that, that's generally the the way I would go. Herb, do you use uh, do you use Herb? Do you use blood meal by any chance? It's really high in nitrogen and also seems to scare away this my ground squirrels and the and the gophers. What was the material again? Uh, just blood meal. Yeah, blood blood meal is very is probably the highest organic uh, source of of nitrogen. Uh, it's it's very expensive. Uh, you know, to, use, to to get a pound of that in a tree, you, you're talking about a hundred bucks probably. So basically, for in an organic uh, an organic strategy, to to get nitrogen into the soil, fish meal, number one. Alfalfa meal, um, some bone meal has a little nitrogen and, and, and the calcium and phosphorus. Uh, cottonseed meal, those, those are the, the real, those are not very expensive. They release nitrogen very slowly. They're used in a organic production. So fish meal, whether it's bones or liquid, uh, use 
and, and bone meal is very good for the loss of end rot and 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 uh, it, it will prevent bitter pit in in apples. Uh, blood meal is very good to get things started in, in young trees if you don't want to add chemical nitrogen. That's the best organic, but it's 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 very high in nitrogen and um, and it's expensive. So these other things are very good: alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, uh, fish meal. I, I think those are the kind of the pillars of of uh, an organic fertilizing strategy. I, I splurged recently and I got 50 pounds of blood meal. It was only $80, so it's really cheap. But you're right. If you buy a five pound bag, you spend $15 or something or $20. It's not cheap. So I bought a huge bag because I'm going to use a lot to scare away my ground squirrels and gophers, uh, hopefully, and, and help feed my trees. Yeah, a lot of the animal repellents have... Um, have blood meal or have, have blood, which which does um, tells the squirrel some 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 something's had it here. Yeah, I was at home Beepo the other day, and I looked at the stuff to scare away the gophers. I said it's sixty percent blood meal. I said, wait a minute, I'm not going to spend ten dollars for this gopher repellent. I'm just going to buy a bag of blood meal. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm reading now, the labels. Now, now you're talking sustainability. <laughs> Herb. This is Alistair again. Yeah. Do you have any opinions on the use of used coffee grounds? Because I generally found them to help a whole bunch, partially because when they're used coffee grounds and fresh, they're quite high nitrogen, but they also, their pH starts at around five. So when it's uh, used as a mulch, there's a certain amount of acidity that actually will go down into the soil from that. While, the, while it's converting from used coffee grounds through mulching into actual compost. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, coffee grounds are, are a very good um, amendment to the soil. It, it increases, it improves the tilth, certainly, and it's a uh, good organic material. Uh, I didn't know that the grounds were that acidic. Uh, suggest, suggests that the those coffee grounds weren't brewed very well. <laughs> Usually you remove a lot of the acid into your cup. But anyway, uh, a lot of those things are best added to a compost pile or to a compost pail, mainly so it all gets broken down. One of the problems with mulches uh, or something that isn't completely broken down is that the soil bacteria are going to use it. They're going to break it down and, and it will help the soil. But it does steal a lot of the nitrogen from, from the tree or from whatever plant you're planting. And you put green mulch down or something like that. Uh, you better have a lot of residual nitrogen there to get if, if, if it's growth you need. So I think I'd just be cautious about that. Most of these things, if when I do it, I add it to the compost because then it's, it's broken down into humic acid. It's not going to steal nitrogen from the tree and it doesn't upset my general fertilizing strategy. Uh, as particularly an organic strategy, we are not using anything that's, that's really quick release. You're trying to use things that have a very gentle uh, kind of prolonged action. But coffee grounds are a very good amendment, very good amendment uh, to get the, the tilth and the organic portion of the soil uh, increased, which is something that, that we need to do here because of our clay soil. Uh, so all those things are good, but be cautious that they do have an effect on this very important area called the rhizosphere, where the, where the roots are trying to balance everything to get the optimum absorption. And it's usually against the gradient. So it takes, it takes, and it, the roots are actually metabolizing. They don't have any photosynthesis. They're using carbohydrate to run the machinery to, to uh, get nutrients out of the soil against the gradient. Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. Prior to COVID, I was able to cultivate uh, one of my local Starbucks, and I would get uh, 20 to 30 pound uh, plastic bags of it. Uh, two to three times a week from them. So I was using it all over the garden. Um, since COVID, uh, it's been a much more of a challenge to get it, but I'm hoping that after COVID, I'll be able to go back to getting it regularly. What was it? What was the effect that you noticed when you use it in all? Did all plants respond the same way? Um, I think we can learn something from that. That's a very good strategy. I mean, that that's the essence of sustainability, really, and 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 being covetous of our resources. But did you notice anything that you could uh, put your finger on when you did that 
the biggest single thing I would say is that I had when I bought this house in 1984, it had three mature citrus trees. Um, we lost uh, one of the two, a uh, lemon and two oranges. The orange, we lost an orange tree about 15 years ago. And the second orange tree was looking rattier and rattier until after doing a bunch of reading, um, it's the, my reading suggested that um, using coffee grounds as a mulch could potentially help to make the, uh, the pH of the soil go down gradually and make the nutrients more bioavailable. So what I did was I took a bunch of coffee grounds and for about uh, three feet radius around uh, this orange tree that was looking really ratty, I put about a four inch layer of coffee grounds. Uh, fortunately helped by the fact that I was getting so much of it from Starbucks. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was done in late autumn, so September-ish, October-ish. And the following spring, the tree was covered. It, it, you could see more white flowers on it than you could see leaves, but it also leafed out a whole bunch more than it had in the prior five years. So I thought we'd saved it. And now, the, three years later, um, the gophers apparently had done, gotten to the roots or something, so we lost that particular orange. We literally just took it out about a month ago. So I'm going to be planting something else. But what, you're, what you've just been saying makes a lot of sense. With plants that I was putting in the ground, I mixed some coffee grounds into the soil to sort of pre-lower uh, the pH. And from what you've just been saying, that was probably close to absolutely the wrong thing to do. Because the roots would have to compete uh, with the, the coffee grounds. Yes, you have to be. You have to be careful. Careful of adding uh, things that require degradation, because the bacteria in the soil will work on them. And um, it is yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. It is maybe at the expense of the roots. The roots may win out in the end. But yeah, that was very. It's a very good observation. Uh, the fact that that the tree blossomed out without a lot of leaves suggests that you were. You were robbing some of the nitrogen, and what that does is that uh, it, it reduced the vegetative growth, but didn't interfere with the flower budding. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons to kind of be careful in the use of nitrogen, particularly in these deciduous fruit trees, uh, and to try and what composting is really the magic here because what the the rules now in the Central Valley, the the laws in California are you can't add any more nitrogen to your soil than what you can prove that you removed with your crop. So basically, that's how they figure out each person's allotment of nitrogen. Because ex the excess nitrogen runs off and contaminates the subterranean water and the well drinking water. So basically, that's a, a very good strategy. And I think we should learn from these things uh, that uh, basically you want to replace what you've used. Now, if you compost your leaves and your trimmings and your prunings, and any uh, cold of the fruit, you're giving the tree exactly what it took out of the soil. And that's uh, anything you add extra from, from the vegetative waste in the house is only to the benefit. So th that's a very good strategy rather than using so many things that you're buying and adding this and adding that. The other thing, the only thing you're not adding back is you're not adding any particular minerals or nitrogen that you've removed with the fruit. So, if you, so in, a, in a commercial area, you're taking out a tremendous volume of something. And that's why we have all these fruit analyses. They tell you what you need, you know, to, re, to replace what apples are consisting of. And that's the way to figure out, look at what you're growing, look at an analysis of what that fruit has, and then try to fine tune what you add back uh, to the soil that you may not be uh, getting back because you've taken all the fruit away. And the nitrogen should be just enough to sustain a little bit of vegetative growth. You don't want, I mean, if you go into a commercial orchard t today that's 10 years old and you, for self-pick and you go back 20 years ago, the trees are the same size. They're not interested in a whole bunch of vegetative growth. Once you've got the scaffold that you want, you just want the tree to produce. You want to keep it healthy, but you you, you don't want the fruit to, 
to be going further and further and further away, like most uh, home peach and, and, uh, and nectarine orchards are, because you need fruit, new, new fruiting wood every year. The old fruiting wood isn't going to fruit again, so you keep getting, getting away from yourself. And that's the, that's the key to pruning. So when we have a pruning session, we'll go over that in detail. But that's 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 the key is to try and replace what you're what you're le- what you're taking away. That's sustainability. It's it's not a complete thing, but that's what it really means. And uh, all these other things can be controlled by fine tuning what you give back and your pruning strategy. Oh, that's enough about that. <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. Uh, when we were doing the discussion of the lady who had the seven-year-old tree that hadn't produced anything, I was wondering if that could have been because uh, it, the tree wasn't being stressed enough to persuade the tree that it needed to start reproducing. Perhaps by giving enough nitrogen through, through the fertilizer she was giving to actually suppress the fruiting. Well, that, well that's one of the actions of, of nitrogen. You're, you're encouraging vegetative growth. And, and when you do, the, the tree has to strategize. You know, if there's a lot of nutrient that encourages and sustains vegetative growth, that's, the roots are really smart. That's, that's, that's what they're going to do. And it's just the same as we, we talked before about positioning. If you've got limbs that are in the shade, the tree's going to produce um, water sprouts and vegetative growth there because it knows what it needs. That's the only way it can make everything because the light is what drives. It's a fuel. It's a gasoline for photosynthesis. Without, without that, photosynthesis doesn't occur. It's, the amount of light and, and proper orchard, orchard management is managing light. And once you have the light activating the active um, pigment, the chlorophyll, or the xanthrochrome, or the uh, whichever one is wavelength it needs, once you have that, then the leaf can take the water from the ground and the carbon dioxide from the air and make carbohydrate. And from that, it makes everything else, everything. All of its hormones, all of it, wood, fruit, wax, seeds. So that basic, that's the basic requirement. And, and that governs that the light, incident light uh, is really the fuel for the whole project. And, and the only thing that starts it off in the spring is the fact that you've stored um, starch and, and sugars, sorbitol in the roots. And, and so the, the tree has some fuel. Uh, before the leaves have formed. Anyway, that's kind of a little <coughs> compressed idea of how kind of to, to think about this. Thank you. You're welcome. I know tomatoes don't, you don't want to put too much nitrogen with tomatoes. They won't produce fruit, correct, Herb? They will just okay. keep making leaves. Well, they'll do what, whatever nutrient you give them. They're going to figure out, I can use this. Uh, but remember, they're there to produce seeds because their whole objective is to reproduce, um, not to make fruit for you. And that's another thing about pruning pruning strategy is that the tree isn't interested in making fruit. It's interested in, interested in making seeds. And so the only way you get it to put all that sweet fruit around it is by carefully managing it. Because out in nature, uh, the size of a peach is going to be the size of a pit. And uh, the size of an apple is going to be as small as that tree can get it. So that something will, will want to eat it and take away the seeds. But basically, all of these strategies, these horticultural strategies we use in the orchard, are to try, try to favor the behavior that we want in our family. <laughs> That's a long answer. Uh, Alan, did, did you want to, uh, do you have any uh, meeting information, anything you want to, any announcements you'd like to make before we uh, close this off? I think we're fine. Um, we still need to, to try to find, uh, you know, a chair for the chapter. So we're still looking for one. But uh, anyway, thank you very much, Herb, for those great presentation. Oh, well, thank you for your patience and, and listening. It, it was delightful to visit with you on a Saturday morning. and and. Uh, Always delighted to come back if you wish. Thank you for the invitation and, and for the great questions. I, they make me think and make me learn something.